So I'm not going to talk much about work that I've actually done today, and many of you will probably recognize bits and pieces of your own papers stolen and, and incorporated this in presentation. My charge was to think about how the field of genetics and genomics might be integrated into answering some of the questions that we all have shared interest in, and specifically how variation in the social environment and social adversity in particular um, might affect the pro process of aging. Well, to start off, we have to come to some sort of consensus or agree on the assumption that genes have something to do with aging in the first place. And so this is a, a really busy slide, um, but it serves to illustrate a few basic points. One, on that first set of panels, um, when folks have looked for heritability of longevity, of lifespan, they tend to have found it. Um, longevity is modestly heritable in humans as well as in uh, non-human animals. So on the left side is a summary from um, Rickliff's work on zoo animals. And additionally, diseases of aging often tend to be heritable as well. And in fact, they tend to be somewhat more heritable than lifespan itself. In the center are a number of panels selected from a much larger series of graphs showing uh, mortality schedules and fertility schedules for different um, animal species across the tree of life. This was from a paper published by Jim Vopel and colleagues last year. As you can see, those curves aren't the same across different species. And in fact, they can be quite different in slope as well as in magnitude. This suggests that fertility and mortality schedules have both evolved across the tree of life implying that there was genetic variation within species upon which selection could act, and that that has potentially led to selection and fixation of different variants conferring different for fertility and mortality patterns across species. Finally, on the bottom, I want to give some credit to some species that have not been talked about much um, in this particular meeting, which I'm sure is unusual in a meeting focused on aging, um, Cenorobite, the Cenorobitis elegans, C. elegans, the nematode worm, uh, flies, and Drosophila melanogaster, and of course mice, in which there's been direct evidence that manipulation of genes, changes in gene sequence, knock-ins, and knock-outs, actually can directly affect longevity and aging. This is very convincing experimental evidence. So with that, I think with, with multiple lines of evidence, we have good reason to believe that if we're going to understand aging, and if we're going to understand social environmental effects on aging, we have to at some level understand what's going on um, with our genes. So um, one way that type of relationship has been pursued, and I think what many folks jump to first, is in attempting to map genotype onto phenotype, that is to look at phenotypic variation in aging or in aging-related traits, and ask how they associate with variation on the level of DNA sequence. Um, this is challenging if we want to think about social environmental effects on aging for a couple of reasons. In humans, what we now know is that longevity is an extremely complex trait, um, and that what that's likely to mean is that it's underlain by a very large number of genetic variants, which tend to be individually of small effect. To identify variants like that, it's important to have very large sample sizes, and genome-wide association studies in this era have now moved to the scale of tens of thousands to over 100,000 individuals to convincingly identify replicable variants associated with aging. That's because every time you identify such a variant, what you're identifying is a, a genetic effect that, uh, that uh, you can observe on average, averaging out all genetic background and environmental effects. We tend to be able to gain more power by focusing on model species, but that power is conferred because what, we're, we, what we tend to do, at least in flies and, 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 uh, and mice and nematode worms, is to focus on animals that are genetically clonal, isogenic animals, which give us great, a great deal of power in uh, performing crosses. We also gain power by the fact that in captivity, these animals can be maintained in a homogeneous environment. So in this sort of um, classical genotype-phenotype paradigm, we treat environmental heterogeneity as noise, either something to be averaged out or something to be experimentally controlled. And in species like humans, individual genetic risk factors will tend to be a very, very small effect 
and if we believe that many of these genetic effects are in fact conferred by rare variants actually of low frequency as well. So this has a fundamental uh, disconnect with an interest in social environmental effects on aging. In fact, if we're interested in whether being high status or low status or socially integrated or socially isolated impacts uh, our longevity, then what we're fundamentally interested in is, is environmental heterogeneity. Okay. In addition, we're interested in these effects from a population perspective because these are risk factors of large effect, not small effect, and because they're commonly observed in the population. Um, one reason that these two uh, areas might, be, might feel so dis disjoint is because um, the major uh, model systems for looking at the genetics of aging don't have this kind of social complexity that we've been talking about um, in, in humans and non-human primates, although one could make an argument for um, some of the rodent models. Okay, so if we think that um, what we're really interested in is how genes contribute to social environmental effects on aging, then I would argue that what we're really interested in is not the genotype phenotype map per se, but rather in the field of functional genomics. That is, how the genome integrates um, developmental cues or environmental cues to alter its effect on phenotype. Um, I think this is in fact implicit in some of the uh, talks that we've heard um, throughout these, this past couple of days. If we're interested, for example, in, in gene mutations that have age-specific effects, then we can't possibly be interested in, in uh, a variant that has a static, a static effect across all environments and all genetic backgrounds. So the field of functional genomics arose after um, or concurrent with the, with the finalization of the sequencing of the human genome. It's been a major focus of the field of genomics in the last six to eight years. And it focuses on what genome sequence does and in what conditions and context it does it, um, rather than the sequence itself, the static sequence that's with us for our entire lives. Um, some of you may have seen this issue of Nature, which came out in 2012. It was a full issue devoted to uh, functional genomic characterization of the human genome um, by the ENCODE consortium, which uh, looked at the same cell types, so the same genetic sequence across uh, many different individuals and many different tissue types, and asked about uh, how much genes were expressed, what regulated those genes, what were the epigenetic profiles associated with the different cell types, what parts of the chromatin of, uh, of the, the, the packaging of the genome were open and closed. And um, this kind of pr perspective has been extended to understanding how the genome differentially responds to things like high or low levels of glucocorticoids or pathogen <coughs> infection or simulated pathogen infection um, by things like uh, lipopolysaccharide. It hasn't so much been, um, been uh, used as a major tool yet to investigate social environmental effects on, on, uh, on the genome. Okay. So what I'm raising here is the possibility that this relation between social environment on one hand and health and survival during aging, that part of the black box that we've spilled so much ink talking about may in fact be due to changes in gene regulation. So what evidence is there for that kind of relationship? So in order for there to be a relationship between social environment and health and survival during aging that goes through gene regulation, we ought to have an idea that gene regulation itself influences something about aging and that the social environment influences something about gene regulation, giving us the potential for a path through gene regulation that connects these two extremes. Okay. So what's the evidence that gene regulation has to do with aging? Um, this too comes from multiple sources of evidence, together which I think make a pretty strong case. Um, the first is the observation that despite hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary time that separate um, our main model systems for aging, we repeatedly see use of, this, of similar pathways um, to modulate how long individuals live. These tend to be stress re response pathways, nutrient sensing pathways, pathways involved in inflammation. And this rec recapitulates uh, 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 what was known as the Hawks paradox in the evolution of development in the 90s, in which uh, developmental biologists observed that 
the same genes seem to be used repeatedly across species, across long evolutionary time. The argument then being that it's not the structure of the genes that changes uh, the developmental phenotype in that case, here are the aging and longevity related phenotypes in this case, it must be how those genes are used. In other words, how those genes are regulated. And indeed, uh, an analysis of the protein coding regions, the structural component of genes involved in aging suggests that those coding regions tend to be conserved, implying that perhaps their regulation is, is what's uh, causing chain differences across species to emerge. A second line of evidence comes from the observation that there's a tremendous amount of plasticity in lifespan within the same species. And that can be extended to cases in which we're actually talking about the same isogenic line. So genetically clonal individuals who can live, for example, in this case, Strongyloides rati, uh, uh, up to 80% difference, uh, full change difference in lifespan depending on whether it's free living or parasitic. These are, these are individuals who have exactly the same DNA sequence. So something about the, their, its genes must be being regulated differently. Similarly, in the case of honeybees, you have individuals who are very closely related, but depending on environmental cues, may live a few months or um, up to five years. This is what's led Cynthia Kenyon to argue that most organisms, in fact, have the latent potential to live much longer than they actually do. A third line of evidence is more direct, and it's the observation that many gene regulatory phenotypes, in fact, every gene regulatory phenotype that I am aware of so far, shows a relationship, um, at least with chronological age. So these data are data from the prefrontal cortex of the brain in humans. These are ages at death, um, because these are, these are brain samples, these are from individuals who are deceased. And what it shows is that uh, the, the brain expression profile, the brain gene expression profiles of younger individuals tend to be very similar to each other. The brain gene expression profiles of older individuals also tend to be similar to each other. And indeed, there's a, there's a great deal of um, linear change with age on a gene by gene basis as well. Okay, so it appears that there is a relationship between gene regulation and aging. Is there similarly convincing evidence that there's a relationship between social environmental variation and gene regulation? Um, this is a table from a review I published last year with my former postdoc advisor, Yoav Galad, which, um, which reviewed this topic. And this in particular focuses on different uh, animal models that have been proposed as models for social environmental variation in humans. And um, most of the data thus far comes from rats and mice and um, to a more limited degree from captive primate populations. In a large number of cases, and I won't review them individually, there is evidence that in these, these animal models, most of the time in which social environments were manipulated by, by um, experimenters, that there is a signature of social environmental experience, whatever that <coughs> environment may be, on uh, aspects of gene regulation, including differences in gene expression levels and also in um, patterns of epigenetic marks. Um, I'll give you one example from work I did as a postdoc um, in rhesus macaques, it's possible to manipulate the dominance rank of individuals in a social group by introducing adult rhesus macaques into new social environments. And it turns out that the order of introduction of adult females into new social groups largely predicts um, their uh, dominance rank in that social group, such that individuals introduced first tend to be high ranking, and individuals introduced last tend to be low ranking. Um, <clears throat> Using this paradigm, we were able to replicate 10 social groups of individuals with experimentally assigned differences in social status. We looked at gene expression levels genome-wide in peripheral blood mononuclear cells, so these are your monocytes and your lymphocytes, and what we observed, oops, what we observed, if you could see it, are differences in gene expression levels that affect approximately 1,000 genes of the about 6,000 or so that we were able to study in this, in this paper. So this suggests that um, the effects of the social environment on gene regulation can in fact be causal, and I think some very, um, very good evidence for this comes in particular from um, rodent studies, perhaps unsurprisingly. Many of you are probably familiar with um, uh, Michael Meany's studies of licking and grooming behavior in uh, rats. So rat mothers can provide a lot of maternal care, engage in high levels of licking and grooming of their pups, 
after birth or low levels of licking and grooming of their pups after birth. Those um, infants here are not dead, they're just not being licked and groomed. And what, um, what Mimi and colleagues showed is that differences in licking and grooming of pups influences methylation levels at the hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor in the brain. Low licking and grooming leads to hypermethylation, high licking and grooming leads to hypomethylation, lower levels of DNA methylation in that area um, of the genome. These in turn lead to differences in glucocorticoid receptor gene expression levels, which have downstream effects on um, that offspring's own propensity to lick and groom her subsequent offspring, and also um, levels of anxiety and stress tests. I bring this example up because it's particularly convincing um, in terms of a causal connection, because in this case they were able to reverse the effects of, um, of early life social adversity. So what they're showing here is um, corticosterone levels after restraint stress. And these are the, the levels, they're elevated for offspring um, of low licking and grooming mothers um, who are treated with vehicle with a control um, treatment. However, individuals who are treated with trichostatin A, a demethylating agent, um, looked uh, like kids of high licking and grooming mothers after uh, uh, restraint stress. Does this carry over humans? We clearly don't have the same level of experimental evidence for humans, but a recent um, population study, small scale population study published by Lam et al. suggests that differences in early life socioeconomic status, as well as individuals' self perceived stress in adulthood, do correlate with differences in DNA methylation across the genome. So what I'm showing you in each of these cases is simply a distribution of p-values for the tests of these predictor variables against uh, DNA methylation levels across the genome. This little elevation here suggests that there, there is a signal, although it's not nearly as strong as um, tends to be observed in experimental settings. Okay, so if the relationship between social environment and health and survival uh, during aging goes through gene regulation, and that will allow us to at least um, fill in part of the black box between those two extremes, then we're suggesting that this relationship on the left must have something to do with this relationship on the right, which is not necessarily, um, which doesn't necessarily follow from anything I've told you so far. Um, and so that raises the question of how gene regulatory studies aimed at integrating social environmental effects um, with gene regulation relate to the biodemography of aging. And I am going to differenti differentiate here between paths forward that are biodemographically motivated and paths forward that are perhaps more closely integrated. So biodemographically biodemo motivated studies simply boil, simply boil down to Biodemographers have told us that this social environment is important. Let's see what it does um, at a molecular or a physiological level. And in fact, that has been pretty much everything that I know about um, in, in the gene regulatory literature relating to the social environment thus far. It's been motivated by the observations that social adversity seems to be costly um, with respect to, to health and survival. But that begs these, that raises these two questions First, whether social environment associated genes actually fall in pathways known to be related to aging, and two, whether social environment effects on gene regulation influence the physiological processes that have now become established as major hallmarks of aging. <coughs> so, oh, this appeared again. Um, with respect to the first question, uh, my postdoc, uh, Noah Snyder Mackler, has been doing a re analysis of genes that we identified in the macaque paradigm as responses to difference, responsive to differences in dominance rank. And he's com been combining that with a large data set on humans in the same cell types um, that identify a large set of genes that change um, with chronological age. And we've simply been asking the question whether social adversity in that case, individuals who are low dominance rank, tend to um, look more like individuals who are older and whether individuals who are high ranking tend to look like individuals who are younger um, based on gene expression, uh, uh, based on individual gene expression data, uh, gene by gene, gene expression data. Um, this is just a summary of, of, of some of our results. What we find is indeed 
that we tend to see uh, directional agreements in the effects of high versus low rank on gene expression and young versus old age on gene expression. So we have more genes in these cells uh, indicative of, of agreement between young individuals and high ranking individuals and low ranking individuals and older individuals than we do um, in the opposite directions. Additionally, if we try to group these, uh, these sets of genes together into functionally coherent biological pathways, what we find is that many of the same biological pathways are enriched in both analyses, are coherent pieces of biology that have to do with aging and with the response to dominance rank. And those include, for those of you in the audience who might be curious about specific pathways, um, things like IGF-1 binding and also um, uh, inflammatory response. Okay. What about the major hallmarks of aging? Well, conveniently, um, Lopez Otin and a bunch of uh, molecular biologists who study aging published this paper uh, last year on the hallmarks of aging. So pieces of physiology that have been repeatedly and robustly associated with the process of aging in, uh, in, in experimental models and also to some degree in humans. So where on this um, map can we place what we know about social environmental effects? Well, we know that epigenetic alterations are routinely associated with aging. And we also know that changes in one epigenetic mark, DNA methylation, are responsive to early rearing conditions in rodents and um, rhesus macaques from experimental evidence, um, with childhood circumstances in humans, and also with variation in social status, again, in rodents and um, rhesus macaques. We also know a little bit about differences in other types of epigenetic alterations, like histone marks, um, in which we tend to see enrichment for stress and inflammation-related changes during aging. Um, I won't say much about uh, telomere shortening since I think um, that was treated well yesterday, but there is evidence that individuals exposed to higher levels of psychosocial stress do exhibit accelerated telomere shortening. And as far as altered intracellular communication goes, here's a role for um, HPA axis signaling, for example. There's evidence that changes in gene regulation following um, social environmental stress tend to change um, aspects of uh, glucocorticoid <coughs> signaling, for example, on within cellular level. And in our macaque paradigm, we, we found that glucocorticoid receptor levels were actually downregulated in low ranking individuals. Okay. I think there's scope for many of these other hallmarks of aging to also be explored in more detail. So, biodemographically motivated studies do social environment associated genes fall in aging related pathways? Preliminary evidence says yes, this tends to be the case. And do they influence the major hallmarks of aging? Well, at least in some cases, although there's much more to be done on this front. What else do we not know in this cartoon? Well, we don't know what kinds of social environments tend to matter more or less, or how they act alongside one another. We don't know whether early life social environments matter more or less than environments in adulthood. We don't always know, we often don't know, whether changes on the level of, of gene regulation actually impact what we really care about, which are health and survival and fitness related traits. And we know very little about what the actual gene regulatory mechanisms underlying all these changes happen to be. Okay, well what about biodemographically biodem integrated studies? Well, one of the uh, main questions is here is how we take the observation that many gene regulatory phenotypes change with age and relate that to these nonlinear changes in um, age-specific mortality rates um, that, uh, that have come up over and over again um, in, in this meeting. Okay. In other words, if social environment influences a gene regulatory phenotype that is associated with age, what is it actually doing with respect to aging? Is it influencing individual frailty or individual uh, initial mortality rate, or is it influencing how um, we change as we get older, the actual rate of aging. There are some um, uh, pieces of evidence from the model systems literature that uh, a genetic perturbation of aging and environmental perturbations of aging on uh, initial mortality rate versus the rate of aging are in fact independent, and that some environmental effects, such as dietary restriction, influence the Gompertz intercept, not the slope. Whereas temperature shifts, which also extend lifespan, influence the slope and not the intercept. 
And that's led to the prediction, largely out of um, Linda Partridge and David Jones's groups, that biomarkers of aging should reflect accumulated damage and therefore be irreversible if the environment improves, whereas biomarkers that reflect the initial mortality rate actually might be reversible. Okay. And they've shown this with respect to um, accumulation of, uh, of some of the biomarkers they've looked at when comparing the effects of temperature, of changes in temperature, to the effects of changes in, uh, uh, in uh, caloric availability. So we obviously can't do the same kinds of things in humans or in many of the non-human primate systems we're talking about, but sometimes environments do in fact change for humans and for, for non-human primates that we observe non-manipulatively, and we can potentially exploit those changes um, in a little bit more detail. And here, um, here I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to skip over this, but I'm happy to talk about this in more detail. This has to do with accumulation of um, epigenetic marks over time. Okay, skipping. Okay. Finally, it may be of interest to ask about gene regulatory phenotypes that parallel in a direct way um, the process of demographic senescence. So in other words, if we have um, a, a Gompertz function here that is shifted somehow by social adversity, we might pr be particularly interested in regulatory, gene regulatory phenotypes that show a similar type of shift with social adversity. Um, there are no papers that have asked that question directly, but there is evidence from some research on gene expression levels in the brain and aging that some genes change with, with age in a manner that is highly reminiscent of what we expect to see for uh, mortality rates with age. So for example, these are clusters of genes involved in DNA repair and in energy metabolism. And after um, the onset of um, adolescence, you can see these sort of nonlinear changes that um, provocatively reflect something sort of gone per se. Um, okay, so like I said, none of those questions have been asked with regards to social adversity, but we do um, see some evidence that similar changes happen between males and females. And again, so this is, um, folks, all right, thank you, sorry about that.